I like it. Praise the Lord. How's everybody doing? You doing all right? In this crazy world, we're surviving by the grace of God. Amen? I'm so happy to be here this morning. Pastor Lemon invited me to speak, and I'm grateful that he has trusted me, looking at the title, <laughs> to stand behind this pulpit. And I want to thank him and the elders as well for allowing me to be here to be in the presence of God with you all and to be fulfilled by his presence as well. Um, just because I'm preaching doesn't mean I'm not being preached to. Um, and so I'm grateful to be here. Bear with me as I set up. <clears throat> I have a hard time speaking and doing things at the same time. I don't know if anybody's like that. Multitasking here. It'll take me forever just to plug this in if I don't be quiet. All right. So I praise God again for allowing me to be here. And, you know, I, I'm excited about the message here. I think it's going to be a, a, a powerful blessing. And I pray that your hearts are going to be open to hearing God's word and his voice speaking to you. So I'm going to pray without further ado here. And I'm going to ask that you would reverently bow your heads and close your eyes as we continue to ask God to be here with us. Father in heaven, <clears throat> Lord, I'm just pleading with you right now to fill this place. Not just the place, dear Lord, for, but fill our hearts. I'm asking, dear God, that you would seize control of our minds and everyone in here, that we would reverence your presence and understand that this is a special moment where we're able to come still and have the freedoms to visit and hear the word of God, because very soon there's going to be a famine, a real famine, for the word of the Lord upon all the earth. So help us to treasure these precious moments to come not only closer to you, but to learn of you so that we can walk out of here changed by faith. So God, I'm asking that you would cleanse this vessel, have mercy upon the human frame, all of us, our minds wander on different subjects as the speaker is speaking. Help our minds to be focused on your word. Be with those who are traveling still to the sanctuary. And I want to thank you for the blessing of the word that you have for us today. In Jesus' name, let everyone say, amen. 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 Praise the Lord. All right. When the church first got to the River Jordan. They were there after a long journey. Finally, the wilderness experience was coming to an end. Finally, all the trials and the tribulations was coming to an end. What God has promised to them was about to be fulfilled. Twelve spies went into the land. And we know the story. Ten of them came back with what kind of report? All right, you, you, you all got to talk to me this morning. You got to help me. Uh, what kind of report? Evil. They came back with an evil report. You see, they saw the walls. They saw the giants. They saw the spears. They saw the opposition. And these 10 leaders, 10 what, everyone? Leaders. These were princes of the people, famous people in the church, men of renown. They came back, the leaders, with an evil report because of what they saw and they sowed doubt in God's word. They sowed fear and they sowed murmuring and complaining. And the leaders instilled with them what they had within the people and caused the people wanting to go back to Egypt. Now, there were two other leaders there that day who saw the exact same thing as the other 10. They saw the walls. They saw the spears. They saw the giants. But instead of focusing on what they saw, they decided to focus on what God said. Amen. The scripture says, for we walk by and not by. I was in a grocery store a couple weeks ago. For those of you who don't know, who don't have young ones, there's a shortage of baby formula going on. And I got a baby that needs some baby formula. So a couple weeks ago, I'm going to the store to get some baby formula. I go to Walmart, Target, CVS, Walgreens, Rite Aid, 
and there's probably another pharmacy I can't think of, but I went there. Corner stores. So I'm hitting up all these stores, and I do not see the milk that I need for my baby. Now, what begins to happen in my mind is all of a sudden this anxiety begins to creep up. It's like this smoke that's building slowly into the room. Anything that's negative comes up slowly first. Anything that's contrary to the character of Christ creeps into your mind slowly first. So this smoke is building up of anxiety, fear, and even anger. Because I'm mad at the people, because I know how people act when, when there's pandemics and there's, there's things, uh, when people get scared, they, go, they, they do that. What, what is a buy-in called? They, the hoard, hoarding, right? It happened when COVID broke out, when everybody bought all the toilet paper, right? You're like, you, you know you don't need all that toilet paper. But you're just buying, just for buying. And so I started, this anger started to build, this, this anxiety and this fear. And before the smoke completely filled my mind and took hold of me, the Holy Spirit stepped in before those thoughts became sin, before it became what, everyone? Because, you know, there's a moment of time before sin becomes sin in your mind. Let's go to James chapter 1. The Bible will make it a little bit more plain what I'm trying to explain. James chapter 1. Let me know you're there by saying amen. James chapter 1. I heard one amen. Young people, if you've got your smartphones, get your, get your smartphones open. James chapter 1 and verse 14. Are we there, church? All right. But every man is tempted... When he's drawn away of his own what? Lust and enticed. Then when, what's the next word? Lust or your desires hath conceived, it bringeth forth what? Sin. So notice this word here, conceived. Here's what the Bible is saying. We're tempted of our own lust. Then these thoughts begin in our mind, conception. You know what that word conceived means in the Greek? It means to seize or take hold. So when these thoughts come in, there's a period of time before it's trying to seize and take hold of your mind. And that's why I use that analogy with the smoke slowly building. But before it has the opportunity to take hold of your mind, because when it does, it becomes sin. That's conception. Now, James is using the analogy of a mother who's pregnant, where if she's pregnant, that's the developmental stage. Sin is not developed yet. But when it comes out, boom, it's sin. So in the developmental stage, it's not sin, but you have to allow the Holy Spirit now. Well, he comes in. You have to listen to the Holy Spirit in that moment before it takes hold. Am I making sense this morning? Amen. So here's what God does. There's that scripture in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So the smoke is building, any negativity, anything unchristlike begins to build, it happens here first. But before it seizes, the wind of the Holy Spirit moves on into your presence. And he's there to blow the smoke away. And he's presenting to you an option. The Holy Ghost speaks according to the word. He speaks according to what everyone? That means if you want to get familiar with his voice, you have to get familiar with what? Come on, young people. Some people ask, how do I know the voice of God? You have to be familiar with the voice. Then he speaks according to the word in your conscience. So watch what God began to do. These thoughts begin to creep up inside of me. And immediately the Holy Spirit steps in. And in my conscience, I'm having a conversation with the Holy Spirit. And he presents the word to me to negate anything that's unchristlike from taking hold of your life. This is what he said to me as I left the seventh store or eighth store. He said to me, Adam, is your daughter hungry right now? And I said, no, she just had a bottle. Okay. Does she have any bottles left for tonight? Any milk left for tonight? I was like, yeah, she has enough for two bottles and that's for tonight only. But tomorrow she doesn't, she's not going to have any more milk. She's going to run out. Then Holy Spirit said this, well, didn't I tell you not to worry about tomorrow? Amen. Let me read the scripture to you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. 
So I said, yeah, you, you did tell me not to worry about tomorrow. And then he said this, okay, Adam, have I ever forsaken you? Have I ever caused you to be out in the street begging for bread? And then he put this scripture in my mind. I'm telling you how the Holy Spirit communicates. I have been young and now I'm old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed, doing what everyone? Begging bread. So now the Holy Spirit comes in like that gentle breeze to blow away the smoke of negativity that's trying to take hold of my mind so I sin. So he interjects. John 16 says he comes to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment, and he's really good at his job. So if you have him in your life, he will always interject before sin comes in. And he presents the word of God as he did to me this day. Now we have a decision to make. He says, this is the way, walk ye in it. Will you trust what your eyes see? Will you trust what your feelings are telling you? Or are you going to trust my word? You know what I told the Holy Ghost in that moment? It was difficult. I said, man, let me turn this car around. <laughs> and I drove on home. Didn't know how the milk was going to come the next day. Now, I got home. Now, before I left, I checked Amazon, because that's, you know, that's the best way to kind of get stuff. Even Amazon was sold out. But as I sat there, and, you know, and, I, and I'm just, I had the peace of God with me, all of a sudden, something inspired me. Hey, why don't you look for a different type of milk, a different brand that you're not used to getting? I said, okay. I looked up all kinds of brands, and I didn't see anything. So I found this one brand. It was so healthy. That's probably the only reason why there was some left in stock. <laughs> no GMO, no soy, no this, no that, no this, everything, right? So I was like, no wonder there's, 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 there's still uh, some of this stuff left. So here was the blessing. So I ordered it. And then when I got to the shipping part, it says, next day shipping for free. <laughs> Look, you see how good God is? So my baby drank that milk. She was done, full belly. Tomorrow morning, I opened the door, and lo and behold, I had two canisters of milk right there. Can you imagine if I didn't trust God and allowed the anger to take hold of me? We walk by faith not by sight. Set your eyes on the word and not the problem. Amen. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are what, everyone? Temporal. But the things which are not seen are what? Eternal. Eternal. Now here's the problem with this spirit and why I'm bringing this message to you this morning. This spirit of not believing God they were right at the Jordan. Their journey was coming to an end. And they manifested a doubt in the word of God. And he never left them in the past. He never forsook, forsook them. But it was this spirit of unbelief and murmuring that caused a delay. It caused what, everyone? It caused a delay. In the end of this travail, and the same spirit that was with the children of Israel then is the same spirit that's with us right now. It's exactly the same. For 40 years did unbelief, murmuring, and rebellion shut out ancient Israel from the land of Canaan. The same sins have delayed the entrance of modern Israel into the heavenly Canaan. In neither case were the promises of God at fault. It is the unbelief. The worldliness, unconsecration, and strife among the Lord's professed people that have kept us in this world of sin and sorrow so many years. The question is, do you trust him? Notice what God says about the generation in Hebrews 3 verse 10 who got to the wilderness. Those, those murmurers and complainers because they doubted God's word and they trusted seeing what they saw in the giants and the spears. Notice what he says about that generation. And what I'm getting ready to read not only applies to that generation, but to this generation, because we are practicing the same sins. So this is the Lord speaking to you and I this morning. Here's what he says. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation. Wherefore, I was grieved with this generation. And said they do always err in their hearts. And they have not known my ways. 
how long is it going to take, God is saying, for you to get to know me? Because when you manifest a spirit like that, you're really telling everybody that you really don't know me. When you allow these negative emotions to take control of you, you're testifying that I don't really know God. And it hurts his heart. And he's asking us this morning, how long is it going to take for you to really understand who I am? Notice the testimony here in Psalms 9, 9 through 10. The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of what? Trouble. And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee. For thou, Lord, hast not forsaken them that seek thee. This verse is so powerful because it says those that know his name, those who are familiar with his character, will not only trust him in peace, but especially in trouble. Amen. The children of God have a tendency to trust God, especially in times of trouble. Now notice what the, one of the signs are that you are trusting God when trouble comes knocking at your door. You know what a Christian does when trouble comes and they trust God? Here's what they do. Psalms 511. But let all those that put their trust in thee be sad. Is that what it says? Be depressed. But let all those that put their trust in thee rejoice. Let them ever shout for joy. Amen. Now ask yourself this. When was the last time you actually shouted for joy? Some of us have never shouted for joy in our lives. When was the last time you were in your car and you were so overwhelmed with the goodness of God that you just start shouting for joy? I've done it. Brother over there done it. And you know, somebody driving next to you probably looking at you like, you crazy. Did you care? You probably <laughs> shout even more because God is that good. Maybe the lack of shouting or the lack of rejoicing is a testimony that there's a lack of trust. There's a testimony that you really don't know who he is. Because I'm going to proclaim to you this morning that if you really know who God is, you're going to rejoice. You're going to shout for joy. Because thou defendest them, let them also that love thy name be joyful in thee. It hurts my heart to come into the house of God and everybody's moping around, singing songs like they're at a funeral, with no joy in their spirit, falling asleep in the sanctuary. You're all telling sermons without opening your mouth. And the sermon we're telling is that I don't really trust him. I don't really know him. Therefore, I have no reason to rejoice. Lord, have mercy on us. How could we sing when troublous times come? How can we sing when dark clouds surround us? How can we sing when everything's against us? I'm reminded and encouraged by this story. The Bible says it was at midnight. What time was it? Midnight during the darkest hour. Your foot is in the stocks. You can't even move in prison. And what do these brothers start doing? They started singing and they were praising God so much. The Bible says there was an earthquake. You know, when you read about earthquakes, that typically means the angels came and joined them. When Jonathan, the armor bearer, was climbing that mountain, when they got to the top of the mountain, the Bible says there was an earthquake. You know why? Because the angels came down. They said, finally, somebody's getting out their holes. Finally, somebody's not scared to bring the word of the Lord to the Philistine. And when they climbed up that hill, the angels couldn't wait and cause an earthquake. The Bible says when Jesus resurrected before he came at that tomb, there was an earthquake. You know why? Because the angels came down. And when they hit the ground, they caused the ground to shake. And when you start praising God, the angels can't wait to praise God with you. Because that's all they do 24-7. Holy, holy, holy Lord God of hosts. Somebody say amen. amen. Praise his name. I got to learn to praise God in my trouble more so than in times of peace. You know, I had COVID twice. Jesus really loves me. I had a really bad in 2020. And then uh, I actually brought in the new year with COVID. I got it Christmas Day. That was my Christmas present. Merry Christmas, right? And then I, in New Year's this year, I had COVID. But it wasn't as bad as the first time. So the first time was really bad. It was 2020. It was July. And there was a lot of fear in the atmosphere. 
right? And, and it was really bad because there was a lot of people dying. Church folks weren't making it. Family members weren't making it. And so there was a lot of fear. And so I'm laid up in the couch in my office. And, you know, I had it all. No taste, no smell, fever, shakes, tremors, all of that. And all of a sudden, I got this congestion thing going on. And it's hard for me to breathe. And I'm being concerned now about having breathing issues. And I'm hearing other people who are going to the hospital for breathing issues. And now, just like I mentioned before, the smoke of negativity started to creep up into my mind. The smoke of doubt, the smoke of fear, and before it seized me and took control, guess who stepped on in? The Holy Ghost. And as I started to worry about breathing, he came in with the word. And this is why we got to read the word, because he comes in with the word, and it's the word that gives us faith to give us the victory over our feelings. Somebody say amen. amen. So he came in immediately with the word. I'm worried about breathing, and this is what he said to me. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. He didn't say, I'm going to take it away. He didn't say, I'm going to heal you. Basically says, stop your whining and give me praise. Man, I got up out of my sick bed, and I started to walk around my office, and I just, I just praising God, shaking and everything. Lord, thank you so much for saving my life. Thank you so much for blessing me with my children and wife. Thank you, Lord, for my job. Thank you, Lord, that I can praise you right now. And as I started praising God in that office, something miraculous happened. You know what happened? There was an earthquake. The spirit of the Lord came into that place. Now, I got up shaking with COVID, trembling with COVID. But when I started to praise God, all of a sudden, the Holy Ghost came into that place. And for a few moments, I was COVID symptom free. Nothing. It's as if God was reminding me of his presence and his assurance. And I, and I, and I laid back down on that couch with tears in my eyes. Because it was that good to visit me in that moment. And then a couple of minutes after that, COVID came right back. <laughs> but I learned something so valuable. That even in your dark moments, it's better to trust in the Lord than to trust in your feelings or anything that your eyes see. Amen. And if I get conditioned to the way, when every moment, every decision in my life that seems really difficult or troubling, I need to be accustomed to hearing his voice because it's in those moments in particular that he's speaking the loudest. And you see what the devil does, young people? He wants to crowd your mind with social media and music and different images so your mind is cluttered so you can't hear the voice of God. So when you get into difficult situations, your mind is cluttered. You can't hear his voice speaking. But the Holy Ghost can speak over that. Somebody say amen. amen. But it's his design that your mind is not cluttered, but it's filled with his word. So that when you come into these situations, instead of hearing and seeing the movies that you've been watching all week, you, you get a scripture that he gives you for that moment in time. And that's how we get the victory. This is how the character of Christ is developed. You know, the 144,000 will have habitually mastered the ability to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit and submit in every situation. And they will continually do that until Jesus comes. Because our nature will always be there. But the 144,000 will always hear the voice. This is the way. Walk ye in it. Yes, Lord. And obey. That's the difference. The most grievous sin of God's people is unbelief. And yet it is widespread and almost universal. It is this sin that has led to backsliding and apostasy in every age. Now, can I be real with y'all this morning? Amen. You know, I like to tell stories of how God has worked victory in my life, but I'm also gonna share stories of how I failed the Lord and I've chosen to look to my feelings instead of his word. Not too long ago, last year, I was very discouraged over some personal things that were happening in my life. Cut me deep, some family issues going on, and I was really hurt. Let me read the scripture because I think this scripture is going to help me explain my situation that took past. Psalms 37, 7 through 8. Notice what it says. Rest in the Lord 
That means trust him and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease from, what's the next word? Amen. Come on, y'all. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. This is a powerful verse right here. It was really a, a, a revelation to me when I read it because last year I was so discouraged over circumstances in my life, I started to backslide and do things I shouldn't do. I was really lethargic in my Christian experience, didn't feel like praying as much, didn't feel like reading God's word as much. Now, I didn't know I was angry. The verse says, cease from anger, fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. I didn't know I was angry with God because of the situations that were happening in my life. But the evidence that I was angry with God was that I was backsliding. Now, I want you to think about this. Sometimes we could be upset with God because things aren't working out in our life and we start to backslide and do things and we don't realize, but really we're angry with God and we're manifesting a spirit of unbelief. You all know what I'm talking about? And so I find myself in this lethargic state and I wasn't alone because I had some friends as well that were going through some difficult times, losing loved ones marital issues, all kind of stuff. And they were going through the same type of backsliding. And some of them openly admit they were angry with God. And what God is saying, there's going to be things in your life that are going to happen that will tempt you to be upset. People are going to bother you and they're going to hurt your feelings. It's a guarantee it's going to happen. But God is saying, don't focus on what they've done. Don't focus on the negative things that have happened in your life. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. Focus on my word and not the problem. I find encouragement in the story of John Huss. You know, this man, if, if, if anyone had the right to be angry over something, it was him. All he was doing was preaching the word of God to the people. That's all he was doing. He wanted to preach God's word. The papacy said, no, you can't preach the word in that language. You're done. He continued to preach. The papacy called the council and promised him safe passage to discuss this thing at a council. Now, he knew he couldn't trust the papacy, but also the king of Hungary was there. And the king of Hungary said, I promise you safe passage. So John Huss goes to this council and he's immediately arrested. Both of them were liars, the king and the pope. They arrested him and threw him in jail. And they threw him in jail next to some latrines. So it stunk really bad and he got extremely sick. He got so sick he was gonna die before the trial that they had to move him to another cell. He was in there for months unjustly, unjustly arrested. Now he could have got upset with God like, Lord, I'm sick, I'm dying, I'm, I'm smelling latrines all day. I'm in this prison, rotting away. But instead of focusing on his circumstances, he focused on the Lord. Now when they finally brought him to the council, they built up this false case against him, 30 accusations that were completely false. They lied on him and said he said this when he did not say any of those things. And each time he tried to defend himself, they shouted him down so he couldn't get a word out. They finally stripped the robes off of him, which was a good thing. He didn't, he didn't need those Catholic robes on him. They stripped it off of him. Then they put the crown of thorns that were made with demon images to say he was an arch heretic. They put it on his head, they mocked him, then they took him to the stake, tied his throat by a chain to the stake, piled up the sticks up to his chin, and then asked him to recant. And instead of complaining and whining, he says, no, I'm standing on the word. And as they lit him on fire, the people could hear him singing the praises of God. What a story. What a story. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him and I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly, what everyone, rejoiceth and with my song will I praise him. He showed the world that he trusted God. He had every reason to be upset. He had every reason to be angry but he decided to give God praise in that moment. And what an impact that made on the people who saw that and for generations 
to come. Let's go to Revelation chapter 5. I've come this morning to give you some encouragement. And by, the, by these verses and by the grace of God, that's exactly what's going to happen. Revelation chapter 5, 1 through 5. I want you to let me know you're there by saying amen. amen. Notice what the word of God says. Sorry. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written on the backside, sealed with how many seals? And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven, nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open, I'm sorry, to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. I love talking about this because this is so powerful to me. One thing we can come, or a conclusion that we can come to safely by reading what we've just read about this book, is that this book has everything to do with you and I. The reason why we know that is because the only person that was worthy to open the book happens to be the only person that came down to this earth to die for me and you. Amen. Which means the book has everything to do with you and I. This book controls or is our destiny. It has all of our information. This book has my past, present, and future. And only one person has the authority to have that in his hands, Amen. and that's Jesus. Amen. Now I want you to think about that. When trouble comes knocking at your door, remember who has the book. When bad times come, he has the book. So even though you don't understand why the things you're going through and why you're going through them, just trust that Jesus has your destiny in his hands. Now here's what's really powerful about this book. A lot of the times in the church we like to focus on the seals so much and we forget that the purpose of the seals is to get to the book. That's what the seals are for. And we always focus on the seals, 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 and we totally forget about the book. But this is the book. This was the whole focus at first before Jesus walked in is who can open this book? And so when Jesus takes the book and he starts to pop the seals, it's for the purpose of open. It's for the purpose of opening the book. So the question is, what's in the book? Amen. Why is this book so powerful? Now, we know it has a whole bunch of information because it's written within and on the, on the backside. It's not customary for scrolls to be written on the other side, only within. But this is showing you that it has all the information concerning this planet in this book. Now, I'm going to read this quote, and I'm going to take my time because it's powerful. Of Notice what's inside this book. There in his open hand lay the book, the role of the history of God's what? Somebody tell me what's providences. How God moves behind the scenes, especially when you're not even aware. It's God working in your life, trying to save you, especially when you're not aware. Or care, brother, that's the truth. You're totally oblivious, but God is constantly working on your behalf when you don't even know it. That's in the book. The prophetic history of nations and the church. Herein was contained the divine utterances, his authority, his commandments, his laws, the whole symbolic council of the eternal. Let me pause. This book contains so much information. Do you know that there's conversations in heaven about you that you can't hear? 
There's a divine council up there who's uttering things about you and I that we're not privy to, privy to right now, but it's in the book. God is up there with his counsel, and you know what they do sometimes? They weigh out trials. You know what? I think Adam's ready for this trial. And there's a debate in heaven about what Adam could take. And then the Lord says, let's do this upon him. And maybe one of the elders will say, yes, let's do this upon him. But if we allow this trial to come upon Adam, let's make sure we have more angels to support him during this trial. Amen. And Holy Spirit, I want you to be commissioned with the word. So that when he goes through this trial and he's buckled by the storm, he has the support of angels and he has the word to get out the trial and to grow in it. All these types of conversations are happening in heaven without you knowing. Amen. And guess where it is? It's in the book. It's in the book. There's a scene in 1 Kings chapter 22 where the prophet Micaiah sees the heavens opened and he sees the Lord sitting on the throne. And he sees the angels on his left and on his right. And there's a conversation going on in heaven. And God is saying, how am I going to get Ahab to, 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 to not go to the or to go to this battle? Who's going to who's going to help out this situation? And at this time, an evil angel comes up and says, I will. And the Lord says, OK, I will allow you to be a lion spirit in the prophets of those false prophets of Ahab so he can go to this battle. So Micaiah sees this whole he sees the council up there. And he, and he hears a little bit of the conversation that goes on. You get a sneak peek, sneak peek also in Job chapter 1, where God is with Job. There's a sneak peek there of what's going on. And so what's in this book is a whole lot of information about your life that you are not yet privy to. But one day it will unroll. Let me continue. In symbolic language was contained in that role the influence of how many nations? Every nation. Tongue and people from the beginning of earth's history to its close. What a book. What a book. So when would the contents of the book be revealed? Now this is where the Bible gets kind of interesting. The Bible gets, goes kind of silent in regards to the clear explanation of when the scroll is unrolled, but we can deduce safely when it will be enrolled. You ready? Let's go to the book of Revelation. Look with me. You should be still there. Let's look at chapter 6. Now, we're going to read a little bit, and I'm going to ask you a question, so it's important that you pay attention. All right? Revelation 6. Let's look in particular at the sixth seal. Remember, the purpose of the seals is to get to the book. So if I'm popping off the sixth seal, can I unroll the scroll? Yes or no? No. You've got to wait till all the seals are popped off before the scrolls unroll. So let's look at the sixth seal. Revelation 6, verse 12. And I beheld... When he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. Now notice the word here, I think it's interesting in verse 14. And the heaven departed as a what, everyone? When it is rolled together. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places, and the kings of the earth, and the great men of the earth, and the great men, I'm sorry, and the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Here's the question. What event does the sixth seal, sixth seal take us to? Say it like you believe it. It takes us to the second coming, right? Now, really quick, Revelation 8, 1. We don't have to read it. It's really quick. Well, let's just read it. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of a what? Now. Most scholars in the church kind of link these two together, the end of the sixth seal and Revelation 8.1, the popping off of the seventh seal. The silence of heaven, most scholars believe that this represents the emptying of heaven because Jesus is coming to pick us up. Does that make sense? I kind of like that view the best. It makes sense. Revelation 6 takes us to the second coming. Revelation 8.1, the seventh seal, is just showing he heaven is empty because Jesus is coming. So here's what we can deduce, that the scroll 
cannot be opened before the second coming. It has to be opened either at the second coming or after. Amen. Amen. Does that make sense? Now, I wish I had more time because I love Bible study. I don't have the time to get into this. But I believe, based on my study, that God reveals the scroll at both occasions. Here's what I mean when I say both occasions. He gives a sneak peek of the scroll at the second coming, but a final revelation of the scroll will happen after the millennium. After when, everyone? Because remember, it contains all the information about how God has been working in your life, but you don't know, but it's held secret in Jesus' hand. Are you with me? Now let me read this quote to you, very interesting. Thus the Jewish leaders made their choice. She's speaking of the Jews who said, his blood will be upon us and our children, crucify him. They made their choice. Their decision was registered in the book, which John saw in the hand of him that sat upon the throne, the book which no man could open. In all its vindictiveness, this decision will appear before them in the day when this book is unsealed by the line of the tribe of Judah. Now this is powerful about this quote, because we know according to Revelation 1 verse 7, let's just do it, let's just go there. Revelation 1 7, we're in Revelation, let's just read it. Notice what it says. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall well because of him. Now I got some other quotes, I didn't have time to put it in, but when you piece them together, here's the picture. Those people who crucified Christ, they're going to get a sneak peek of the scroll. Of what kind of peek? (laughs) Just a little bit. It's going to be revealed to them as Christ is coming in in the clouds, how they betrayed Christ and how God was working in their lives to accept him. And they're going to see that. And then they're going to cry out, rocks fall on us because of the contents of the book. Now, they get a sneak peek at the second coming, and that's why the word scroll in the sixth seal is talked about. But the rest of the wicked will receive the revelation of this information after the millennium in Revelation 20, 11 through 13. Now, I'm going to read this very long quote in Great Controversy, page 666. You can't forget that page. It's going to, I believe, describe in detail when God enrolls and lets them have this information. You ready? I'm going to take my time, and I want you to stay with me. Here we go. As soon as the books of record are opened, and the eye of Jesus looks upon the wicked, they are conscious of how many sins? Every sin which they have ever committed. Let's digest that. I'm 41 years old. Do you know how long that's going to take for me to see all the sins I've done? You know how many sins I've done in one day? That means God is going to show me in a personal movie. This is, everyone's going to, if you're wicked at this time, you're going to get a personal movie with God. And he's just going to reveal to you and unroll, watch this, everything you've done. They see just where their feet diverge from the path of purity and holiness, just how far pride and rebellion have carried them in the violation of the law of God. The seductive temptations which they encouraged by indulgence in sin, the blessings perverted, the messengers of God despised, the warnings rejected, the waves of mercy beaten back. You know what this sounds like to me? They're going to see God's providences. They're going to see how God has been working behind the scenes the whole time to save their lives. And God is going to show them from all angles of their life how he's been involved in every single angle. Waves of mercy beaten back by the stubborn, unrepentant heart all appear as if written in letters of fire. Now, here's what's powerful. He's going to give all the wicked a personal revelation, an unveiling of the skull to show them how he's loved them, how he's cared for them, how he's kept them, how he sought them. All the providences of God will be revealed to them in that moment personally. Then God is going to do something awesome. He's going to step back after everyone receives a personal revelation. He's going to step back and then unveil to the whole world how he's loved the whole world. Can I continue to read? 
This is what he does next. Above the throne is revealed the cross. And like a panoramic view appear the scenes of Adam's temptation and fall and the successive steps in the great plan of redemption. Do you know how long this is going to be? So everybody gets a personal revelation of how God, his providences has worked in their lives. Then he takes a step back and shows that I've loved you even before you were born. And I'm going to show my love in each generation of Earth's history. And he goes all the way from Adam to the cross. And I'm not going to read the rest, but it, she basically describes how God is going to take his time showing the whole life of Christ to all of the wicked during this time. Here's one thing I want you to understand. In Revelation 20, it's a courtroom scene. Now, what kind of scene? It's a courtroom scene. And there the wicked are gathered. And when the wicked are, 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 are come up in this second resurrection, they're going to come up angry and bitter with God. And Satan, the chief prosecutor, will be there in the courtroom. And all the wicked will be his witnesses that God is not fair, that God is unjust, that God is not loving. And Satan will have a host of witnesses to accuse God. He'll point to one and say, you see, this person was abused all their life. They were in an orphanage and they were beaten from this home to this home. And that's why they hate you, God, because of what you allowed in their life. This person maybe had a sickness or a disability and they were angry with you, God. And you let this happen to this person. And that, that's because you're unjust. And he's going to go. All these witnesses will have a grievance against God of something that God has done. You know, that's why many people are atheists today. They're angry with God. It, it doesn't, they can't fathom why pain and suffering is in this world and why they had to go through why they, what they went through. And they're bitter. And Satan is railing and he's got all these witnesses. But then in walks Jesus into the courtroom. And in his hands, he has this book. And this book contains the dynamite evidence to completely shut down the prosecution. God is being accused. Jesus walks into the courtroom and then he unveils the scroll to each accuser. Personally, they get to see how God has loved them all along. They're going to get the answers to the questions that they didn't know during this life. And God is finally going to give them the answer to the why, Lord, why? They're going to see it. And then he's going to show the whole prosecution, his love from Adam all the way to the cross. And you know what this scroll does? It totally vindicates the character of God before all the wicked. It's the most powerful piece of evidence that Jesus has, and he's waiting to whop it out at the right moment. Have you ever seen a court case where the prosecution is convinced by the evidence so much that he says, you know what, I was wrong and you're right. I've never seen that in a court case. But it's going to happen in this scene. Because the Bible says, according to Romans, that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall what everyone? That means all the accusers who said, Lord, you did me wrong. Lord, this happened. Lord, that happened. When they see the evidence, they're going to drop to their knees. And they're going to say, Lord, you are worthy of the praise. You know what that tells me? I might as well ask the Holy Spirit to give me the heart to praise God now, even though I don't have the answers, just trusting that he does. Or I may end up in the crowd that ends up worshiping God anyway, but if I wait till then, it's going to be too late. If I wait until I receive all the answers, it's going to be too late then. And so what God is saying is, do you trust me? Do you trust me? No matter what situation you face, listen to my voice. I will guide you in the way in which you should go. And it's your responsibility not to trust your feelings, but to immediately trust, thus saith the Lord. Just like Caleb and Joshua. They saw the walls. They saw the giants. They saw the spears. But they said, we're not focused on that. We're focused on thus saith the Lord. 
And that's what God is developing. You know, Job never got the answers. Do you know he asked God, why is this happening to me? Why, why are you letting this happen to me, Lord? He never got an answer. You read the book. God never answered him as to why I let this happen. You know what God did? He said, Job, I control the waves. And I tell the waves how far they can go. And as I'm controlling the waves, Job, I'm also controlling the navigation of the stars at the planets. And while I'm doing that, Job, I'm speaking to nature. I cause it to rain in the wilderness where there's no, where there's no people. And while I'm doing that, Job, I talk to the lightning. I tell it where to strike and where it can't strike. I'm also dealing with man. I'm able to put wisdom in the inward part and give the heart understanding. And anybody who is proud, I'm able to abase. And those who are humble, I'm able to lift up. And while I'm handling all of that, Job, I make sure that the young lions and the ravens get their food. I command the hawk to fly by my wisdom. I told the eagle to mount up on high to keep his young ones safe. Who are you, Job, to darkeneth counsel with words without knowledge? Without knowledge. Without knowledge. You know what Job said? He said, Job, Lord, you can do everything. I've spoken of things that I knew not. And Job never got an answer. But you know what he became? He became satisfied that God was in control. And he became satisfied that though you slay me, yet will I trust him. But Job will get an answer. Because when he gets to heaven, I love this. I love telling this part. When he gets to heaven, he's going to be shocked when he sees a line of people lined up to see him outside of his mansion. And he's going to talk to his angel, and he's like, man, what's up with all these people? Why are they lining up to see me? And the angel's going to say, oh, oh, that's right, you didn't know. When you died, God raised up a prophet named Moses, and he wrote your story in a book called the Bible. The Bible? What's that? Well, God used prophets, and he put his words together in this book, and your story's in this book. This book is the most popular book on earth ever. Really? Millions of people have read your story, Job. Really? And when they went through storms, when they went through difficulties, when they went through marital problems, health issues, financial problems, whatever it was, your story gave them the courage, and they're here to thank you. Amen. You know what Job's going to do then? He's going to bow his knees again. He's going to throw his crown on the floor and say, Lord, now I understand. It is in the day of trouble that we feel the preciousness of Jesus. You will be given opportunity to say, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Oh, it is so precious to think that opportunities are afforded us to confess our faith in the face of danger and amid sorrow, sickness, pain, and death. I wanna do something pretty awesome but before I do, I just want to encourage you all. Some of you may be going through a storm right now. You may be focused on your feelings. You may be focused on the circumstances. This world is producing the condition of unbelief. When you watch the news, it's to encourage unbelief. And if you keep watching social media, it's to encourage unbelief. So you operate by your feelings and not the word of God. Today, God is saying, stop focusing on the world. Stop focusing on CNN and Fox. Stop focusing on social media and focus on thus saith the Lord and the voice of the Holy Spirit. Because it's in your troublous times that's when he's speaking. If you're not going through trouble right now, here's one thing I promise you. Trouble is coming. Trouble is coming to all of us, and I believe it's coming very soon. And this is the habitual condition that God is trying to develop within us even now. So here's what I, I want to do in closing. I want us to act together by faith and just give God some praise. What do you say? Amen. Can we do that? So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Go in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 5, and no matter what you're going through, let's just praise God right now. Now, we're going to read this responsively. 
That means I read a verse, then you read a verse. I read a verse, then you read a verse. And when you get there, join me in standing. You've been sitting down too long. Stand up and let's give God some praise. Amen? Now, when we read these words, I want you to read it like you believe it. I want you to read it with some holy enthusiasm. Amen? Be connected to what you're reading because this sort of praise is going on in heaven right now to the one who has your destiny in his hands. All right? So I'm going to start off. You know what? I'm going to ask that you start off with verse 8. Then I read verse 9, you read verse 10, I read verse 11, so on and so forth. Can we do that? All right. It's on you. Somebody start and, and everybody together. Go ahead. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Saying with a loud voice, worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Hallelujah. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, and such as are in the sea, and all that are in them heard I saying, Blessing, and honor, and glory, and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb forever and ever together. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. And God's people said, Amen. Hallelujah. Your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed. Father in heaven, I'm just asking right now for more of your spirit in Jesus' name. Your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed. Here's my appeal to you. You haven't been trusting God as you know you should. Maybe it's evident in your deportment. Maybe it's evident in your attitude. Maybe you've been murmuring and complaining or backsliding. I don't know but you have not been trusting God like the way you should. And today, you want to set your eyes on Jesus again. You want to be renewed in your trust. You want to be able to hear his voice and obey when he says, this is the way, walk ye in it. The Lord is speaking to you and you're saying, listen, I want to renew trust in God because my condition is not what it's supposed to be. If that's to your desire and the Lord is speaking to you, I'm asking that you come to the altar Come to the altar and say, Lord, I want to renew trust. I want to renew trust. I want a refreshing again. I want to hear your voice loud and clear. I haven't been trusting as I should. Lord, I want to I trust you like Job. No matter what's going on in my life, no matter what turmoils I face, no matter what the devil has done in my past, give me a song in my mouth, Psalms 40. You know, the Lord will put a song in your mouth if you trust him. The Lord will put his spirit in your heart if you trust him. Come to the altar. We come to church for this purpose, so that the Lord can change us. This is why we come to be like him when we go out there. We can show a hurting world how to praise God. Amen. That as we're hurting with them, somebody's singing. Somebody's praising. Somebody's giving him glory. Because very soon he's going to unroll the scroll and you're going to wish you've given him glory. But we can't do it until we come. We can't do it till we come. If it's possible, could you kneel? If it's all, if it's possible. If it's possible. If not, you can reverently bow your head. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we're so grateful you've brought us here to your throne. Lord, we all admit, including myself, that we don't trust you the way we should. Our human nature, the sins of the past, things creep up on us and it overwhelms us. Lord, lift up a standard against it. We surrender our hearts to you today, knowing that you can do it. 
It says in your word that you will keep us in peace. So, Lord, we're asking for the Prince of Peace to install this peace within us. Give us the instinct, dear Holy Spirit, to listen to your voice in the moments when negativity tries to take over. Give us the instinct to hear your voice and to submit to the word that you provide to us in that moment of trial. Give us the, uh, uh, the wisdom to fill our minds with the tr precious word of God so that when the storms come, the Holy Spirit can give us the power to overcome in those moments of trouble. I want to pray, Lord, for the soul that's been really burdened here. Maybe guilt has overtaken and shame. And I'm asking that you would wash it away and refresh your people today. That when we get up, Lord, we get up as children of God. Put a song in our mouth. Put a song in our heart that we would shine like the sun is shining today on this beautiful Sabbath day. Thank you for this reminder this morning and for what you've done and for what you will do. In Jesus' name, let God's people say, amen, amen. amen.